Welcome to the SRS Podcast. I'm your host, Aaron J. Babiar, and I'm the Training Director of Support Raising Solutions. Whether you're a new ministry worker or a veteran looking to increase your competence and confidence, Support Raising Solutions seeks to bless you in your quest to be a spiritually healthy, vision-driven, fully funded Great Commission worker. My guest again today is Aaron Bergen of SIM. And Aaron and I have been buddies for several years now. In fact, I got a chance to have dinner with her and her husband, Ben, and their three beautiful daughters uh, just about a month ago. So she agreed to come on and talk with me once again, this time about kids on support raising appointments. And as uh, Aaron, as a mother of, of three daughters that are uh, you know, barely even reaching their teen years yet, and, and so much less than that, you know a thing or two about this topic, don't you? Yeah, it's fun. Uh, my kids are four, seven, and nine, and as you mentioned, we have all girls, so that makes for a really interesting dynamic at our house. Yeah. Now, I know that you have raised and lived off support for about a dozen years, and of course, you you and Ben met uh, within SIM, but uh, in addition to the kids and having a couple of dogs, I know that you mainly, you live in the U.S., but you have been stationed in West Africa and and, uh, you know, Ben does some security training in the IT world. So you guys are, I guess, you're what I would call grizzled veterans. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but I think that people need to hear from grizzled veterans on best practices. And, man, having kids around support raising is just an interesting topic in and of itself. In fact, I'm guessing this might be one of the uh, – most commonly recurring themes that's been coming up on the podcast. So let, let me ask you this. Why is this such a point? I mean, you're a mom, so you're, you're going to know the answer to this. Why is kids and support raising such, such a point of attention? Uh, I think there's a lot of answers to that. You know, if you have kids, you know that at any moment they can be a total wild card. Yeah. Everything's cool everything's copacetic and you walk into something and your two-year-old has a total meltdown mm. and you're like, great, what am I going to do now? You know, they, they have that perfect timing for throwing up at a support appointment where you're just about to make the ask or about, you know, not liking where they have to sit at the dinner table when you're sitting with supporters or saying, I'm not eating that food. There's so <laughs> many different fun things that come up with that. And you know, your reaction to that is very telling. And especially if you're doing it in front of other people, that can be a big growth point for you, but also very challenging. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we are going to take a different tact on this particular conversation. People are wondering, is this going to be the same thing that was on that other podcast? No, this is different because uh, I we have spent time talking about uh, having kids take ownership in your support raising, which Aaron, I would love for you to at least touch on that, but that's okay. that's not our main topic. Uh, I think we've talked a little bit about how to incorporate kids into the support raising process, even if they aren't in the meeting. Again, that's not going to be the main thing we talk about it, but Aaron, again, you're welcome to talk about that. You can touch on those things, but in reality, we want to zoom in mostly on a different thing, which is actually having support appointments with kids in the room and all the various ways that 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 can be a blessing or a complete meltdown crazy thing you question <laughs> <laughs> so first of all let, let's do touch on those those lighter topics just to just to kind of clear the deck on that talk okay. a little bit Aaron about having kids take ownership in your family's support raising process okay so my oldest daughter is nine and a few years ago, we went to Thailand and we were in China serving some of our, we went to serve our team in Thailand and stopped in China for some tourism. Okay. But my nine-year-old was fascinated by Thai culture. And it started before we left, getting her prepared with good expectations for what it would look like for her. Her younger sister is about two years younger than her. And so that looked different. The sure. baby at that time was a year and a half. So we knew that that was just going to be us having to figure out how to care for her well in a completely different situation and scenario and meeting her needs and making her comfortable with, okay, you're still with us, so you'll be okay, but not knowing how she was going to react. Sure. But for my older two, getting them excited about it and drawn into it and explaining to them what we thought it would look like and even understanding some of the 
anxieties maybe that we had about it, I think it was helpful for our kids going into it to get excited. They talked to their friends about it. They shared about it at school. It was funny when my, she was graduating kindergarten at the time that we told her we were going to spend a chunk of the summer overseas. And so at the end of the school year, the kids are talking about, oh, what are you going to do this summer? And the teacher asks them, one kid's like, I'm going to go to my grandma's. And another kid says, we're going to spend the whole summer at the pool. My kid says, we're going to Asia. And all the kids turned around and the teacher looked at me and she was like, you're a monster. I'm like, what? <laughs> she thought it was my kid just lied. I'm like, no, like legit, that's what we're going to do. That's how we're spending our summer. We're going to minister to our teen there. And then she was like, oh my goodness, that's amazing. Right. So it opened a lot of really good touch points because not that I want to use my kids as a tool to further ministry, but I want my kids to feel like this is their ministry too. Yeah. And they definitely had some roles while we were there and some things that uh, when Hannah, that's my oldest daughter, when she came back, her teacher asked her to give a full presentation. So she dressed appropriately. She spoke and tied to the other kids. And while we were there, Hannah knew that. And those were things that she was like, okay, I need to learn some phrases in Thai so I can share with my class when I get back. Wow. Uh, yeah. And that's definitely her bend. So me knowing her that she loves languages and she loves culture you know, right. feeding into those things and making time in our trip for her to like take a Thai cooking class was humongous. Yeah. Um, so just, to, just to tie a loop within that too. Um, I know we're going to talk more about be, kids being at support raising appointments, but your daughter, uh, she knows that you raise and live off support and, and, but she's realizing that, that she has a place in what your family does ministry wise, even to the point of, not just getting on an airplane every now and then, but, but actually, uh, you know, engaging with the culture and being able to think and talk about and explain what it is that you're doing, even if that's not like in a support raising appointment. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was always, what are we going to be doing mom? It was never, Oh great. I'm going to be, I wasn't leaving her at grandma's for the month that we were gone. It was, Hey, these are the things that you get to do and that you get to be involved in. And what are you excited about? And how do you get to minister to the other kids on these teams? I mean, those teams have kids from all over the world serving in that location. And so my kid was excited to make new friends and what the benefits are for her. But she also knew that she could come into it speaking into it, becoming friends with these kids intentionally and getting to know them better and building her, her side of things that were interested for her ministry. Yeah. I mean, being a, a little girl, she didn't have an idea for that yet, but us putting in her into that intentionally people thought we were crazy like wait i'm sorry you're taking your kids to asia with you and i know that as people first raise support you probably get some of those questions like why would you take your kids overseas away from their grandparents you are an irresponsible parent <laughs> <laughs> but right. for my kid it opened her eyes in such a big way uh, and while we're home staff and we're raising support to do that you know when she has questions like mom why why do we live in Charlotte, North Carolina? Why do we work here? Why don't we live close to grandma and, and pop up and our other family? It's, this is what the Lord has called us to do. And right. what's your ministry and school look like? And these are the ways that we minister to people. And when we have um, hospitality in our home, my kids take a very active role in that. And they want to know, okay, how many kids are coming? And sometimes I tell them it's no kids and they're like, hooray, I don't have to share at all. But, <laughs> <laughs> you know, for them to be able to talk to the other kids and, and build those friendships while my kids are in the U.S. and they're not technically what most people think of as third culture kids. They're definitely, they have a lot of things in common with some of these kids who have this transition and feel far from their families. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my cool. younger kids haven't developed yet what their interest in ministry are going to be. But my daughter said to me the other day, mommy, when I get older, I want to live overseas. I said, oh, well, wow. why? And, and so it's, we're planting those seeds in them intentionally to be okay with that. Well, hey, that's great, Aaron. And I know that, um, you know, getting kids, their hearts and minds wrapped around what we're doing is so key. I've had too many conversations with too many kids of ministry workers that it was mom and dad's thing. And they were just around, you know, they, they were around. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they were along for the ride. They didn't have ownership. So, you know, kudos to you and, and, and Ben for for doing that. But let's do segue into the other conversation that we wanted to touch on briefly, which is just how to incorporate your kids in, into the conversation of a support appointment if they're 
not there. And we are going to talk about if they are there later on, but how do you connect that, that question of what, what are you doing with your kids? Why are you taking your kids to Asia? Why are you moving to Thailand? Like how, how do you really just talk in, in, in a clear way to supporters and potential supporters about your, about your kids role in, in the missions work that you're called to? Right. Don't be surprised when someone asks, what does this look like for your family? I mean, we already covered that in a big way in the boot camp. and talking about your family as a whole. I mean, if Aaron, I know you go on a lot of support appointments by yourself, uh, but you're still talking about what it looks like for your family and painting that picture for the people you're meeting with. When we go and my kids aren't there, we're still talking about what it looks like for my kid or what the expectations will be when we get to the place where we're going and what does schooling look like for them or what does it look like um, a number of families who go overseas the husband might come off sounding like this is my ministry this is the thing that I do and then people are looking to the wife so she doesn't just look like a you know a willing victim being dragged across the ocean but aside from the wife who's there and gets to share about her ministry I think it's important to be sharing intentionally about what the day-to-day -day looks like for your kids. So they're never viewed as an afterthought to your ministry. Yeah, we look yeah. at God being first. We look at our spouse and our family, and then we look at our ministry. And I think that that's a healthy order. And when we start to lose sight of that, and it's easy sometimes because we think, well, I have to do this for the ministry because I'm doing this for God. That's true. But I think there has to be perspective in my kids fit into this calling and they're not an afterthought to my calling. You know, you brought up a good point within that. Uh, I got a, a real good friend who has a, a child who's, um, I think the best way to say it is just on the, on the autism spectrum, uh, mm -hmm. but they live and serve internationally. And he was struggling when he was raising his full support last year. He is fully funded now. Uh, but he, like, he didn't want to even mention the fact that his son needed a, a special school. And as, as I challenged him to unpack that, he went from almost wanting to hide that and the, the budget figures into really, I believe, coming full circle. And first of all, let me just say, he's not ashamed of his son in any way, but he wasn't sure how to talk about that. Mm -hmm. and, and when he came full circle, he realized, no, I need to tell people, hey, our son is great and he's a part of the ministry and he actually gets to interact with some of the people we're serving in this way and they love him to death, but also he needs a special school and unfortunately it costs more just like it does in the U S. So it almost became like this special gift, like line item budget thing where people now might send a couple few thousand dollars just for, Hey, put this towards your son's school. Like they're excited to help support that part of what their overall budget is because they realize this is a family who are ministering in that culture and there is a special need for their son who has special needs. It's a, it, it, it's a part of, so it actually it invited people with more ownership into their support need instead of being something that they, they, they felt bad, almost like they, they needed to hide it. Right. I think that that's great because you never want it. Like you said, he's not ashamed or embarrassed. And this is his son that he loves, his child that he loves. Mm -hmm. And just like I mean, the Lord has given us a calling or a passion to go to a particular place. And we do that thing. And that might require language school. That might require a four wheel drive vehicle to be able to put your family in this particular place. We want to make sure that our families are thriving and that our kids have what they need. And if that's international school or supplies for homeschool or a special schooling, then we need to be real about those things and communicating yeah. openly and never make it look like any of those things are hidden or, you know, behind the curtain. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, we've been holding off on this other topic. So let's I know, go ahead. Yeah. Building up the anticipation towards what yeah. they really want to hear. <laughs> the wonderful, <laughs> messy, and I do mean literally sometimes, <laughs> of having kids in support raising appointments. My disclaimer, when I get asked about this in boot camp, I will most frequently say, hey, you probably don't want your kids there. <laughs> now, <laughs> I have four kids. Hey, we really? Have kids. We love our kids very much, both of us, but they are a complete wild card. And sometimes they're a wild card with flair, right? <laughs> oh, for sure. Oh, for so, sure. Vomitous flair sometimes. And start, if you would, with uh, the story that nobody wants, 
I do believe you had a child who vomited during a support raising appointment. Once. Yes. So why don't yes. you start right there with the low lights? That way we can say it's better for me. <laughs> All right. So we, uh, we had this family that we wanted to meet with that had been receiving our newsletter for a really long time, but we've been praying about approaching them. If my husband has a relationship with the husband and they don't have any children. And my husband really was like, I really need to sit down and, and meet with them. And so we did that. We were at a restaurant and my husband was sharing and you're building rapport and how are things and what's new. And we hadn't seen them in a while. So it takes time to order and the kids need to order. And it's always a little bit of anxiety with what they're going to have and what they're not going to eat. We'll skip forward that a little bit. And the uh, children get... are finicky. I'm going to, I just had dinner with them. They, <laughs> they are, are a little finicky. finicky. Let's just be on official record with that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the other night they refused to eat asparagus at work that the chef had made. And it was, um, why are you punishing us and making us eat vegetables? That was delightful. <laughs> <laughs> they ate it and actually really liked it. Good. So uh, Good. she responded by saying, wow, this is even better than my mom's. <laughs> oh, there's really no winning in this. And I love my kids. They're an amazing blessing from the Lord. They keep me humble and they keep me young with lots of gray hair anymore, but they're yeah. great. But yeah. support raising is a different animal when you take your kids with you. So we had our three kids on this meeting and we were at um, a lovely, I'll tell you, we were at an olive garden so I can set the scene for you. Mm, high class. So, Yes, very lovely. I know. Aaron's question to me was, with all the other restaurants in the area where you were, why did you go to an Olive Garden? <laughs> 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 That's just where the people wanted to meet. That was me knowing my audience. There you go. There you go. And uh, so my daughter kind of made this face and she's like, oh, mom, I don't feel so good. I'm like, well, maybe you'll feel better after you eat. Just sit down and eat. It'll be fine. Yeah, that's but a the sauce to that. Daddy's talking. No, I have to listen. I have to jump in and like give my spiel here in a minute. Just hold on. Hold on. Right, right. And uh, so she's just like making this face, like, all right, it'll be fine. So she comes over and she sits with me. She's like laying across my lap. And we're done the part where we built rapport, caught up, and my husband's just about to turn the conversation to making the invitation for these people to join us. And he's like, so I was wondering if you would, and at just that moment, my daughter says, mommy, I don't feel so, and unloads. <sighs> all over the floor at this restaurant i'm like oh my goodness i mean like check please we're out like we are done like that meeting is over and we're like if you write a check right now we'll let you leave did you try <laughs> it was so yes um i don't even have the right word to describe what went down in me and that 30 seconds of emotion that flooded me right afterward <laughs> i felt so bad for my little girl I felt so bad for the other people that were there, not to mention my other two kids that are like, ew. Right. And then the server who has to be there, I'm like, do I try to clean this all up? How do I make this right? I have to oh. fix this. The oh. people came and they were like, here's your check. You can just go. You can just go. Just, no, we got this. Like they pull out hazmat and cones and gloves. I'm like, I can never be in this restaurant again. This is <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there's the horror story. What about the follow-up? Like how... There's, hey, let me just be clear too, because I, I, I don't know your answer here. I don't care what they did. Uh, I don't care how they responded. First of all, I'm sorry. <laughs> as funny <laughs> as it is, I'm sorry. That happened. But there's kids... a communication point. There's a follow up. So how did you recover? How did you, how did you follow up? I mean, what did what did Ben do in in reaching out to these people in, into an un, from an unrecoverable situation? How, how did he recover? How did you guys recover? Well, we're still friends with them. We still have that relationship. Um, all three of my kids ended up getting the stomach flu on that trip. And oh. so it was really, we weren't in a position to be able to swing back around to meet with them while we were there. And we live far from them. So the next time we're there, it's our plan to sit down and meet with them again. They still get our newsletters. My husband still has a good relationship with that husband. And it's a, it's one of those talking points now where it's like laughing. Like I'm sure when we see them again, it'll be like, yeah, where do you want to go for a restaurant? Oh yeah, not the Olive Garden. So we'll, we'll poke some fun at that. Um, and then we'll pick right up where we left off with them. And they're really good people who love us and have known us forever. So we can do that. Um, yeah. And as we met have with, some shared experiences, right? Mm -hmm, some definite shared experiences. we got good history with them now. They didn't get sick. We did connect with them. We thanked them again for meeting with us. We inquired if they got sick. We explained that everybody then got sick in the following days and 
they would be praying for us. So it was good to bolster our relationship. Right. We have to come back to making that invitation for them still. Okay. So yeah, okay. I was wondering about that last part too. So you feel like you need to kind of have another go around on, on making a clear invitation, perhaps without uh, pizza sauce in the mix, right? Agreed. Agreed. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> All right. So that's kind of the worst case scenario, right? And there might be right. worse ones out there. In fact, let me say this. If you have a worse, a, a, a terrible support raising appointment, I'd love to hear about it, friends. So please send that. <laughs> right in to Aaron Daddy are at Support Raising we might, Solutions. We might make you a guest just for the fun of it. <laughs> we could make like a whole one section of a newsletter that comes out from Support Raising Solutions. Really, really bad, laughable appointment. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, or it could be like a worst of a uh, podcast episode in the future. Yes. <laughs> I want to interrupt this podcast for a brief heads up. This is Steve Shadrach, author of The God Ask. Support Raising Solutions is running a contest to win an SRS swag pack. Go check out our past podcast episode number 29 to get details on how you can get involved and possibly win some fun support raising solutions swag, including a hundred dollar gift card. You might have heard us mention or refer to SRS Foundations, which is essentially the online preparation for SRS boot camps. It's a tool for leaders within organizations to use in a couple of different ways. For new staff training, as the online training component, which is combined with your own organizational live in house training, or it can be used as a refresher training for your veteran staff. In order to have access to SRS Foundations, you do need to be an SRS Network member. Well, I don't know if it's normal for most people to bring their kids on support raising appointments or not. I avoided it just because I do love my kids, but they are such a wild card. It wasn't always an option. There were times that they needed to be there. And, and again, I, I do want my kids to feel like they have ownership in all of this. But sometimes we might want or need to bring our kids with us on support raising appointments and, and they might act out. They might kind of, things might happen. So talk to more about the, the kind of the topic there for just normal, like some of the what ifs and what to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. Now, normally when we do our support raising trips and when we go someplace, normally we're on the West coast doing ours. That's where Ben is from. We take our kids with us and most people are looking forward to seeing our kids us being a family of five, a lot of the people that we tend to meet with also have children. And so that's a normal interaction. And we get it set up. We're like, okay, the kids can eat in this area and the adults can eat here. And we're in a safe place where like, we're at a house with somebody and we're meeting and still see our kids. And we have a good relationship with them that I'm never worried about our kids interacting with their kids. Uh, and we'd like to take our kids on those kinds of things. And it helps them, as you said, to stay involved and feel like they have some ownership. There's other times where our kids can't go and whether they're sick or Ben's meeting one-on-one -on -one with a pastor or if we meet with the mission sport. And it's not always a good idea to take our kids with us, but we'll have to make other plans. I will tell you that when our kids were sick, Ben went on a support appointment by himself with people that he's known for years. And we had to call them in advance and tell them that the kids were sick. They told Ben to still come. But when he got there, he said, you could see that they were disappointed that my family wasn't there. They had set up this mm -hmm. really cute table with like, um, fun little fiesta. They were serving tacos. So they had like little fiesta hats for the kids and like little maracas on this little empty table that sat empty all night. Ben's like, it was so sad. Oh, so then they asked us to come back and meet with us again because for that family, for that group, actually it was a small group that asked us to come. Yeah. They're like, we want to see your kids. We're excited yeah. about seeing your family. They had a party for the kids. They needed the kids to make the party. They did. And the wife was like, it's great that you're here, Ben, but really we just wanted to see your kids. So <laughs> they really didn't care at all about so much for seeing Ben. They could see him someday at church. Well, I mean, I like Ben. He's, I guess he's an okay looking guy. But I, yeah, he's a good dude. Yeah, I'll keep him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So when the kids are there, tell us about some of the, the curveballs that can get thrown at you and, and how to prepare for them. So some of the definite curveballs, I think, are related more to the general problems that we see age-wise with our kids. They said, I have a four-year-old. We did a lot of support raising when she was like two and two and a half. And you can't meet people after work in an evening and take three young kids and expect there to not be like bedtime drama. They're tired. They've been up doing stuff all day. So you have to think, all right, what can I take for my kids to make them comfortable? Because I'm going to be in a stranger's home. 
you know, I might have been there a couple of times when I was younger, or but now I have kids, and you know, is it safe? Like, do they childproof their home? Probably not. There's breakable stuff. We end up kind of tag teaming our kids in the conversation, depending upon how things are going and what our kids need. Uh, the environment. Generally, when you walk into a place, you're going to get a feel for like, all right, kids, you got to sit right by me and don't move. Or, okay, it's fine. These people are comfortable with having you here. You can sit right here. But I take stuff for my kids to do books, coloring books, crayons, little activities, not generally so much like tech stuff. And I'm not a big fan of giving my kid my phone, especially in public. There's just too much stuff on that. And it definitely sends the wrong signal to people I'm meeting with like, okay, technology babysitter. I want my kid to kind of be involved, but that's very age dependent. Like it, it varies greatly. Devil looks for opportunities to discourage me. And sometimes that comes in, in the form of my initial reaction to when things don't go the way I want them to go in a support appointment when my kids are there. If that's in the form of a temper tantrum and how I react or a kid who gets sick or girls who are fighting, which mm. I think any parent sees their kids fighting a lot uh, and it's normal, but other people aren't used to that. I think I have to be very intentional about setting good expectations for my kids as we start, but also rewarding them. Like, mm being very graceful with them and in the conversation, it's hard. People are gonna notice how you interact with your kids. And I think making sure that they are valued and that you extend grace to them and how you minister to your children speaks volumes to your supporters about how you are in general, but also in ministry. Uh, if uh, something hard comes up, I think most people, your supporters, your potential supporters, they want to rally around you. Try not to overthink the situation. You definitely want to be your normal self and don't take on, I have to be perfect. They're judging me for how I interact with my kids. You obviously want to be loving and kind as the Lord calls us to be with our children and to lead them well. Uh, I think that if you let your children run amok in a support appointment, that sends a different kind of idea. But you definitely have to keep in mind that if you choose to take your kids with you on support appointments, there are going to be curveballs and you have to kind of be prepared for them with some tips and some tricks and some things that'll work with your kids, whether it's busy books or activities, right. yeah. things for them to do, games, things that are easily portable, not lost and not damaging to the place that you're going. Karen, when your kids have gone with you, how old were they? You know, uh, I've been on support for about 15 years, and my kids are currently ages 15 through 21, so I've kind of ran the gamut, and, you know, I, I really got to the point where I tried to not, um, you know, bring my kids, but there are times that they have to come. I do have one supporter in particular that they are a monthly supporter, but every year, uh, they, they like to give a, a special gift as well. And our routine has become that since they live less than 10 minutes away, they like to have me over for coffee and, and, and share a, a story of a changed life and uh, let them know about what, what a current big gift need might be. It's actually, it's a joy. I actually love to do that with them. It's not, it's not taxing. If I had to sit down and do another ask with all of my supporters every year, that would be exhausting. Uh, but, but, but this isn't, and this family is fantastic. But they happen to have a daughter the same age as my daughter. In fact, that's how they met 10 or so years ago in ballet. <laughs> so there's been a, a decade of a relationship. And they have always said, hey, 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 yeah, come over and tell us about the next big thing. And, and please bring Macy, bring your daughter, you know. And, and so that's the sort of thing where I'm very willing to do that. But, you know, even as the girls have, have aged over the years for that, that once a year meeting, um, they're a total distraction sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So even still, the, they'll run inside from being on the trampoline and, you know, oh, did you know that so-and-so had this thing happen and blah, blah, blah. And it's just like, it's really inopportune. And I've learned to just roll with it. Like I've just mm -hmm. learned to go, it's going to happen. This isn't going to be my quote unquote 20 minute presentation with a clear ask. Like it's, there's going to be a clear ask, but it's going to be a couple hour meeting. It's going to have a different rhythm, a different flow from most of the, the middle of the road things that, that we train in the SRS boot camps, And that's okay. Uh, their daughter is, is their, you know, to a degree is their life. And um, I mean, obviously they're in other things, but you know, they, 
they just love their daughter very much and and their daughter just kind of walks in and interrupts at all sorts of times and always has and that's their fault <laughs> it's not right. a big deal it's i mean it would be a big deal if i you know made it made a big deal out of it it's really not and and their daughter loves my daughter and my daughter loves their daughter and so it's like okay there's there's going to be a little planned chaos within that support raising meeting but it's okay so we just we just roll with it and sometimes I have to start over stories or, or reset the scenario of the story of a changed life that I've already started and been interrupted twice and it, it's not that big of a deal. If all my meetings went like that, I'd, pl I'd probably pull my hair out, but <laughs> it, it's not that big of a deal. So I just kind of had to learn to flow with it. Otherwise, um, on the rare times where we've had meetings and the kids have been involved, I've just been said, hey, you know what? dad's sharing about our ministry and I need to do most of the talking. Your primary job is to sit there and, um, you know, listen and learn. And if you want to ask a question, that's great, but I need you to not hit your brother. Yes. <laughs> you know, the whole hands to yourself thing is a really good point. <laughs> and that works all the time, but sometimes the the, the slight degree of formality that I'm actually addressing this in advance of the dinner, it kind of helps them go, Oh, okay. I got to be on mm -hmm. my behavior. I yeah. do not want my kids to feel like they are a burden. And so there is a delicate balance there. But, you know, if you prepare your kid, if you talk to your kid, if, you, if your kid understands that, hey, this is what we get to do. We get to invite people. And I'm going to even talk about money. Um, then it's not such a, you know, I don't think it's such a burden. The, the one caveat, though, and I had a different guest not too long ago about this is, we don't want our kids to feel like whether or not the people give is dependent upon our child and their behavior and them being perfect. That is right. not our heart, but we also have to probably say that because our kids might accidentally infer that. Right. I think that that's a really good point that our kids have to understand that we're asking people to pray about partnering with us and look to the Lord for this. And they're not the Lord and they're not going to make or break how this thing goes. I mean, we're, we love them and their part, I mean, our, my kids are my partners in this support raising thing as well. Um, and so for them to understand that, oh, was I, it's because I was bad, they don't want to support me? No, not at all. It's a choice that they make. Just like when they say no to me, I can't take that rejection on as my own. My kids can't take that on either. That's just not fair to them. Yeah, yeah. So when you've had meetings, one of the things that we talk a bit about when your kids are younger um, if it's, if you haven't sold the house and if you still have a home, a lot of us will invite people to come to our home, especially if they also have young kids, or if they don't have kids, if they're comfortable coming here, this way, my kids have the environment that they're used to having. And I can say, girls, why don't you play in your room for a little while? Why don't you, you know, finish your reading from your homework? And the, the normal part of our day still gets to hold, but we get to have our guests over. We get to show hospitality and my kids are, are comfortable. Often that means they're going to come running in, mom, mom, I saw this, fill in the blank. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> that's kind of normal. So mm -hmm. how do you feel about um, holding support appointments either in your home or in about in the home of others where, you know, your kids have been before and they're comfortable? And we've even gone and like scoped out, we have supporters who say to us, meet at a park. It gives right. your kids something to do and then we can chat. Yeah. How do you feel about being intentional about setting the environment and the stage? Boy, that is a fantastic question, and I have some pretty strong opinions, so I'm going to say this is not gospel truth. These are just my opinions based off my experience. <laughs> so, <laughs> so do not hold it in your home. <laughs> like, I'm like so like, boom, like underline, uh, bold, italicized, quotation marks, do not hold it. <laughs> I very strongly feel that way. Let me tell you why, though. Um, number one is I want my home to be a place of peace and, uh, and I don't mind hosting people, but when, um, w when I get done with the appointment, I need to go home. Like mm -hmm. I, sometimes I, in particular my family, uh, we, we kind of need the ability to catch our breath and, uh, I don't have the biggest house in the world. I don't have the smallest house, it, but, but when we host people, it's all in and it's awesome and it's fun, but. I don't want to kind of mix that with support raising most of the time. I want to be able to end the meeting when I want to end the meeting. And if there's someone else in my home, they may or may not know that it's time to leave. 
Right. Oh, that's a good point. I don't want to kick them out, but <laughs> the kids might have school in the morning or we might be well past the place socially where we have the energy to continue to engage and entertain. And I might have already had a really, really, really long day and you know, it's nine o'clock at night and the kids got school in the morning and I haven't even watched basketball yet. You know, like there are these <laughs> things that, that need to happen. And so, uh, you know, I'm not saying you can't have your kids or excuse me, you can't have people in your home for support raising, but generally speaking, um, I prefer to have an environment that, that you can leave when you need to and when you're ready, whether that's a, somebody else's house or a park or a restaurant or something like that. Uh, that being said, you did ask a great question about what about the kids. You know, if you can be at a, a good neutral site where the kids can have fun, that's great. And I actually have had support raising appointments at a park that's two blocks from my house several mm -hmm. times. Um, also, we have Chick-fil-A's in my area of the world, lots of Chick-fil-A's. And so I have definitely had several meetings at, at Chick-fil-A's because a lot of them have little play places. So, uh, and my kids are even older now. I mean, so I've done, I've done that sometimes just on behalf of the other person. So, you know, when you're thinking about kids and what are they going to be doing, I think it's very wise to think through, okay, where would be the most opportune place? Not just for me and my kids, but for them and, and for their kids. So, yeah, I think thinking through that is really smart. And oh, by the way, one more caveat. My kids are older now. My, my youngest at the time I'm recording this is a uh, nearly 6'3", 200 pound, 15 year old. He's a <laughs> giant, he's bigger than me. And he reminds me of that every single day. Uh, but you know, there's, it's not too hard for, to, to bring him along if I need to. But in, in the past, uh, when he was younger and we were first raising support, I would, I would try and connect with people and they would kind of give me the excuse of, well, I'd love to meet, but we work full time and we're not morning people and we have kids. And on a few occasions I have said, Hey, you know what? I understand what it's like to have kids. Let me make it easy on you. I would love to connect with you. And it sounds like you want to connect with me. I don't want to invite myself over to your house, but would it be easier for you if I were to come over like, you know, after bedtime, I, I, I wouldn't mind if, if it's good for you, I wouldn't mind coming over at eight o'clock at night or, or even later. And I've had a couple people go, no, that messes with our rhythm. We don't want that. But I've had just as many people go, Oh, really? That'd be amazing. We haven't had adults in our house since our kids were born. That would be fantastic. <laughs> you know, and, and they're excited because they're going to put their kids to bed at, you know, whatever, seven o'clock or seven thirty, And, I'm going to show up at eight o'clock and we're going to drink decaf instead of, you know, the regular stuff. But, <laughs> but I had some great meetings with people that have been invited to join my team after eight o'clock at night in their homes. And they appreciated how we put that together. So, uh, you know, going back to your original question, I, ah, yeah, ask, think, plan, strategize. What's going to be the best environment for you to be able to clearly invite people to, to be a part of the vision for ministry that God has given you. That, that's really the point. Kids, yeah, they make things messy, but they're awesome. But if we can think in advance about how they're going to be involved or not involved or engaging or perhaps in the back room, like if we can have a plan for that in advance and, and be ready for the curveballs, generally speaking, I think it's going to go well. I agree. I think that us anticipating some of the issues that we could face, talking with our kids about what we expect, uh, what it's going to be like. Sometimes that means a dry run through, like we've driven by that park. We'll tell the kids, we're going to have this meeting tomorrow instead of playground. And I get a million questions. Do they have slides? Do they have swings? Do they have this? We're just going to drive by. You guys can go and play, see what you like. You know, if we have time, you guys can hang out here for a little while. And dad and I are going to you know, sit at the bench right here and work out, okay, what's the schedule look like for the next couple of days and you guys can unwind. I think it's important that if, especially if you're traveling a large distance with your kids, we always talk about as individuals, packing out your days, making your time count as much as you can, you know, keeping track of things that have changed and writing down contact information. But for us, it's also very important with young kids to make sure that for when my kids go with us on support trips and appointments, which is like 95% of the time, I have to build in things for them to get them excited about it. And I also need to plan in extra time so that if they need a break or we need to change some things around for a rest for them, that we can do that. 
sometimes that means Ben goes by himself or I go by myself or we'll stay up a little later and go do something fun for them. I don't want to go through, you know, if I'm in a place for a week or more and my kids by the end of the first week are dragging because it's a big change for them. And while kids are really resilient, I also know that sometimes change is really hard for them too. So we'll build in some fun things intentionally and we'll make some of the other days really big, heavy days. We're meeting with people, we're driving here, we're visiting this church, we're sitting with these people. That's important and I love my kids and I want them for us to be a part of that. I want people to see that my kids have a vibrant part of this ministry and that I am thinking as their parent, how am I providing for them? What does this look like for them? And that I'm prepared to answer those questions. But I also know that a big part of providing for them uh, and not just, you know, where are we going to eat so we can feed the kids, but is also being sensitive to their emotional needs and knowing when it's time to give them a break, still maintaining a good bedtime and quiet time and praying with them and reading with them and doing those things that are normal so that they feel secure. Yeah. When you balance all that, you start to think, yeah, maybe if I go by myself, this would be easier, but it's nowhere near as fun. You know, how many people get to say their kids are up all over the Olive Garden? There's two of us. Boom. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I, oh, I'm, I love how you put that. I love how you put that. There's a lot of needs that your kids have and, and uh, if they're going to be involved, that's great, but you do need to think through, you know, their physical, their emotional, their spiritual, and you got to think through their, their needs and, but honestly, through their attention span as well. So True. that's a really good point, Aaron. <laughs> anyway, well, Aaron, thank you so much for joining me again today. I always appreciate your wisdom. And uh, any final thoughts or, 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 or words of wisdom that you would send out to people that are considering how to bring their kids into the support raising process? Keep a journal. Definitely write all those really horrible, embarrassing things down because I want to hear about that podcast. <laughs> and Aaron definitely wants to do the interviews on that. Um, I think that just like how you prepare to take your kids on a road trip to go visit families, whether it's, you know, for the holidays or for whatever, think about those things that your kids need to make them comfortable. And that might mean that they have to sit right next to you during that appointment. Make that okay. You're still their parent before a lot of other things. And they need to not feel that you're trying to build a distance because the support raising thing is so important. It is. It's crucial that you invite people into the ministry but how you interact with your kids in those meetings speaks a lot about you. And please don't let your anxiety about raising support or, you know, the areas that you're uncomfortable in dictate your relationship with other people. And that includes your relationship with your kids. You really want to dig in deep and embrace that. They're your family forever. You need to hold them tightly. And the Lord gave them to us for a reason. And we need to honor that. And it's a challenge every day as a parent to, to love your kids to the fullest in the way that Christ would have you do that because we're short-tempered people, because we're impatient. Do everything you can to build into your day-to-day, -day with, especially at support raising appointments, so that later you don't have to come back and feel like you have to apologize to your kid time and time again because you push them off for these things. So yeah. being intentional, thinking through that helps a lot. It'll help a lot of broken feelings or hard hearts and things like that. Yeah, good word, good word. All right, Aaron, hey, thanks again for joining me today. Thanks so much, Aaron. We'll see ya. Thanks for joining us for this episode. We would love to hear your ideas for future content. Please visit supportraisingsolutions.org slash feedback to share your thoughts and questions. Also, wherever you download your podcast from, be sure to subscribe for future episodes and come back each week to gain more insight into the process of building and maintaining your personal support team.